So this lecture is on the weight set point, and the weight set point theory really explains everything that patients tell me about their struggles with weight control. Uh, it explains how recurrently people experience losing weight on a low calorie diet, but always regaining that weight. And the theory suggests that the weight set point is predetermined by your weight control center, which is a powerful center in your brain that controls appetite and metabolism. Basically, basically it says that your brain's in control of your weight and it's not your free will. You can fight against it short term, but in the end, the subconscious brain will win and it will get your weight back to the, set, the weight set point. Our traditional way of thinking about weight regulation is this energy in, energy out equation. So if you eat more food and take in more calories than you expend, then you'll put weight on. If you take in 7,000 kilocalories per day, so 7,000 kilocalories in total, that equates to about one kilogram fat stored. And we're told in order to um, offset that, we can either increase our physical activity or go on a diet. And basically this theory suggests that energy regulation is in our own control. Uh, it's under free will, and if you suffer with obesity, then there is some, you must have some sort of problem character flaw. But unfortunately, the energy in, energy out theory <clears throat> is sort of backed up a little bit by epidemiology. So here is a, a chart looking at um, total calories in the food supply uh, over the years in America. And you see in 1980, the total calories consumed on average by the population increased over 20 years by 500 kilocalories per day. Uh, and this coincided with an increase, a sharp increase in the incidence of obesity. However, when you look at the figures uh, a little bit more closely and do your calculations, um, so if a population is consuming 500 kilocalories extra per day, you can actually then predict that over a year, the population on average will gain 20 kilograms per year. So over 10 years, everyone's going to be over 200 kilograms. But the actual weight gain of the population is 0.5 kilograms per year. So this is equivalent to uh, an energy excess of only 11 kilocalories per day. So actually, it's very, very accurate, the weight regulation center, to about 0.4% of energy taken in. But we have this missing energy intake of 489 kilocalories per day. And the question is, what has happened to that? Are we all going to the gym and expending more? Because it actually takes quite a lot to expand at almost 500 kilocalories per day. And if we look at the research, we can go all the way back to 1984, where um, this famous experiment called the Vermont Prison Overeating Study, which, looked, which asked prisoners, inmates of Vermont Prison, to gain 15% and then 25% of their body weight by overeating. The prison employed a full-time uh, chef. The prisoners had a full American breakfast. We all know how big that can be unlimited sandwiches for lunch, a large evening meal of meat, potatoes, and vegetables, and then for supper before bed, they had another full American breakfast. Those successful weight gainers would gain early parole, so they were um, really incentivized to, to gorge themselves and eat as much as possible. Scientists increased their calorie intake from 2,200 to 4,000 kilocalories per day, but they noted that actually most prisoners had real difficulty uh, increasing their weight to 15%. Certainly, 25% uh, was very difficult to reach. They ratcheted up the calories and in the end had to feed the prisoners between 8,000 and 10,000 kilocalories a day to reach their target. And this was four times more uh, energy intake than really they would have been calculated to have needed. So the energy was going missing again. Some prisoners actually reached a threshold and couldn't put any weight on, couldn't gain more than 15%, despite taking in 10,000 kilocalories per day. They looked at the metabolic rates of these uh, prisoners uh, after th they gained so much weight and found that they were in overdrive. They had a high pulse rate, high blood pressure, and they were generally quite hot. Another famous study looked at starvation and weight loss, and this was the Minnesota Starvation Experiment in 1944. Uh, and this was actually towards, took part towards the end of the uh, Second World War, 
the politicians knew that there was going to be a big problem in Europe with a lot of malnourished and starving people and they wanted to learn a little bit more about the physiology of starvation and how much to feed people to keep them alive. Um, they recruited a group of conscientious objectors, quite a lot of them were Quakers, um, who refused to go into battle and kill anyone but actually were patriotic and wanted to help the war effort so they were quite happy to be used as, as guinea pigs. They were rationed to 1,500 kilocal kilocalories per day uh, and hard physical exercise was continued. After 24 weeks, most of the recruits had actually lost 25% of their body weight, but the scientists looked at their metabolism and noted that it had dropped by 25% more than expected. In fact, 50% in total, but 25% was unexplained. Um, you can see the skeletal uh, appearance of um, some, uh, one of the recruits after the 24-week uh, starvation. The scientists uh, commented that the pulse and blood pressure were low, the candidates were breathing slowly, and their body temperatures were low. So conversely to overeating, they um, noted that metabolic rates had gone into shutdown. A more recent study by Rudy Label's group at uh, Rockefeller um, looked at 10% weight gain and weight loss, but using a really, really accurate um, technique to uh, assess basal metabolic rate. Um, and they used it, and they asked lab workers um, to gain the weight and then lose the weight and lose more. He found that with a 10% weight gain, metabolism increased by 500 kilocalories per day more than would be expected. And with a 10% weight loss, basal metabolism would decrease by 250 kilocalories per day more than expected. So again, the body seems to be fighting by adjusting basal metabolism against overeating or undereating to maintain uh, some core weight or what we would describe as the weight set point. We can see in animal studies when you overfeed mice, uh, they sort of forcibly increase weight. And when you underfeed them, they obviously lose a lot of weight or don't gain as much weight as possible. The black dots here represent mice that just were fed normally. When the uh, dietary manipulation, so the overfeeding or underfeeding, was stopped and mice were just allowed to eat whatever they wanted to, let their appetite take over, they found that the overfed mouse, within a few days, had lost a lot of weight and gone back exactly to the level that the mice that had never been dietary manipulated got to. Again, with the underfed mice, they reached a level very, very similar to those that never had dietary manipulation, suggesting that the brain really holds the key to where it wants your weight to be. So this weight set point theory, really, uh, we think that the weight set point is probably determined by age and sex, quite a lot by your genetics, by this other process called epigenetics, so the switching on and off of genes uh, in response to the uterine uh, environment when you're, when you're growing as a baby. And quite a lot also by our environmental signals. So what signals we're getting will determine where our brain thinks our healthy weight and healthy fat storage should be. If you take the example here, so if you increase weight by going on holiday or overeating, uh, you then get an increased metabolism, as we saw with the uh, Vermont prison study, and a decrease in appetite. It's really hard to overeat. And this then forces the weight back down to the normal set point again. If you go on a diet or you're involved in a famine or you're seriously ill, you'll lose weight. But again, the body fights against this, as we saw in the Minnesota experiment, to decrease your metabolism, but also to make you voraciously hungry. And this maintains the set point uh, of your body weight at a level that, as I say, your brain, from the genetic and environmental signals it's received, thinks is the most healthy for you. We know from looking at uh, people who should have similar me metabolic rates, so sim people of the same age and sex and size and fitness, that we sort of suggest we, we, we sort of think that they should have really similar metabolic rates. If you're the same size, then you know uh, it should be similar. But actually, if you look at the metabolic rates of the top five percent versus the bottom five percent, there is a 
70, oh, sorry, a 700 kilocalorie per day difference. So this is a difference of a 10k run or a uh, four or five course rich meal uh, every single day between the lowest metabolizers and the highest metabolizers. And this is something totally out of your control. The body is in control. Metabolism will adjust up or down and get you to the set point that uh, it thinks is correct for you. So my suggestion is, and I think most people have picked up on this, dieting doesn't work because it doesn't change your weight set point. You have to look at your weight set point and try and change that. Now we know it's determined by these factors, but you can't change your age or sex, you can't change genetics or epigenetics. So the only thing you can really change is your environment. Um, and this would really be related to your food environment, your home environment, the amount of stress you have, how well you sleep, and your general activity levels. And here are some sort of general tips on how I think weight set point can be adjusted up or down. So with your food environment, uh, certainly don't calorie count. As soon as you starve yourself, you're sending a message to your body that you're in an environment that occasionally there is a famine, and it actually wants to pour more uh, energy into you and store more energy. So your weight set point actually, with recurrent diets, low-calorie diets, will ratchet up slowly. And we see this because we see that when people come off diets, they regain the weight, and usually they regain a bit more as the weight set point has increased in response to that environmental clue. I think foods with high GI index, uh, processed foods, these, these will all increase your weight set point. Uh, grazing and snacking will increase and keep your insulin levels high and uh, make it very, very difficult for you to lose any weight. Um, if you cook and plan and prepare your foods and have regular square meals, this can have a really positive effect, I think, on your weight set point. One of the cruxes, I think, is optimizing your omega-3-6 ratio. We know animals have a weight set point. Uh, most animals in the wild, even in the presence of abundant food, will maintain a healthy weight. They don't get too overweight, they don't get too underweight, they have a healthy weight. Um, but we know some animals actually will put on a load of weight um, just before hibernation or pour. So with the squirrel, Signals from the food that it's eating, so the omega-3-6 ratio, from spring food to autumn food, from grasses and berries to nuts, will change the omega-3-6 ratio and change the weight set point in the um, squirrel, and also, um, so it will increase weight, and also encourage food hoarding behavior, so lots of nuts in the burrow. If we look at the brown bear, it will actually voraciously eat and it will increase its body weight by 30% in the autumn. And there is a suggestion that this is triggered by either a change in the omega-3-6 ratio or a decrease in vitamin D level as autumn comes. So the signals are from the environment to the brown bear. Suddenly the weight set point increases, their metabolism will decrease and they'll become voraciously hungry and within two months they'll have gained a load of weight. Now I'm not suggesting that this is the case in humans, but I would suggest that we don't know everything about obesity. And something like this may be responsible for part of the population really suffering with a high weight set point. People say uh, um, to improve your omega-3-6 ratio, you need to take omega-3. So you've got to eat oily fish and take uh, fish oil, cod liver oil, and things like that. Actually, it's the ratio which is important. So. It's probably more important if you're taking in a lot of omega-6, you know, you've got to take even a, a whole load of omega-3 to actually affect that ratio. It's much more beneficial to understand where the omega-6 is coming in and cut that down. And the main culprits really are vegetable oils, shortening, and margarine. So basically processed foods. You can see all of the vegetable oils here, they have a real preponderance of omega-6 apart from flaxseed oil. So, in order to change and optimize your omega-3-6 ratio and maybe decrease your weight set point, eat more oily fish, fresh vegetables, grass-fed meat, grass-fed dairy products, uh, and decrease your vegetable oils and processed foods. That's probably more important than increasing your omega-3. 
What can we do with the home environment to reduce our weight set point? Uh, just like just general habits, avoid having tempting snacks in view. If you've got a big house, sack your cleaner and actually do the cleaning yourself. If you like gardening, do more gardening. If you like dogs, get a dog. All of these factors actually will reset your weight set point down and within a year will have an effect of decreasing your weight by five or 10 kilograms. Much better than going uh, on a diet uh, unsuccessfully. Habits like leaving the car at home for short runs and also getting regular sunlight. We know that, every, that most patients are vitamin D deficient. We don't know whether obesity causes vitamin D deficiency or the other way around. But I have a suspicion that it may be that some people develop um, a high weight set point in obesity because uh, of a lack of vitamin D or a decreasing level of vitamin D. Sleep and stress are important. Uh, any, any animal that is stressed and has high cortisol levels will not want to lose its energy reserves. We know that if we give people steroids and uh, cortisol, uh, they will increase weight and become centrally obese. So if you're under constant stress, you need to try and understand it and plan how to deal with it. And it may be you know, home issues, it may be relationship issues, but they need to be dealt with. If you're really, really um, serious about getting your life in control and reducing that weight set point. Mindfulness is um, increasingly being used to help stress. Hobbies and interests are great. Avoiding late night artificial light from the computer or TV uh, I think will help people sleep and the more you sleep uh, the less stress you have and it has a very a beneficial effect actually on your weight regulation. If you can't sleep take a warm bath, have a cup of tea, read a book. Get into these types of habits, this will make your body much more amenable to having a lower weight set point. Um, activity. Um, I would suggest that unless you really can go to the gym pretty much full time, several times a week for a long time, probably favour day to day activities. Um, in fact, if you're only going to the gym for 20 minutes or half an hour twice a week, probably switch that, you know, for cooking time, cooking and preparing food. It's actually much better for your metabolism and your weight set point. We know that if you do exercise a lot, people tend to take in more energy. Short bursts of muscular activity are really good for your metabolism, so I would suggest maybe getting a nap, like the seven minute workout, that sort of thing. Doing a short burst of activity is really good for muscle health. Uh, conversely, really extreme sedentary behavior, like sitting in front of the telly for hours on end, uh, is terrible for muscle health and muscles are the things that regulate our metabolisms up and down. So in conclusion, um, long-term weight regulation is not under our conscious control. I think it's determined by our weight set point and only changes in our environmental signals can alter the weight set point downwards. Thank you.